habitus and inertia on the base camps of the practicing life. One more time, height and width, anthropological proportionality. The preceding reflections on Nietzsche, Wittgenstein, Foucault, Heidegger and Heraclitus leave us with a number of observations about the anthropological proportion articulated by Binswanger. It was this Heidegger-inspired pioneer of psychiatric anthropology who elaborated the basic phenomenon of existential directedness into an elemental ethics of space or proportions especially in his largely overlooked study of, on Ibsen from 1949. There he explains how human self-realization in ordinary life takes place above all in the polarity of narrowness and width, while the dramas of intellectual and artistic self-realization are mostly located in the dimension of depth and height. In both cases, one observes life's, life's basic kinetic tendency, of which Goethe noted... We humans are dependent on extension and movement. While existential mobility in the horizontal is dominated by a relative symmetry of outward and return journeys, vertical mobility is often characterized by an asymmetry, when the descent is not simply a mirror of the ascent, no application of the Heraclitian formula, the way up and the way down are the same, but rather a fall. I have examined this relationship from the perspective of a key phrase from Binschwanger's text, also adopted by Pravu Matsumda, tragic verticality. Binschwanger does not, incidentally, comment on the natural objection that there is also a kind of fall in the horizontal, when the step into width becomes a forwards without return, as embodied by the wandering Jew or the flying Dutchman. The tragic asymmetries observed by the psychiatrist in vertical movements do not concern height as such, either in the physical or in the moral sense. They are more related to the inadequate ability of the agent who climbs to a height at which he is unable to move. In general, one should assume that the same ability which allows a climber to reach the top would also bring them down again without any trace of tragic verticality. Only if non-ability or non-consideration of the boundary conditions for ability interferes, as with the flight of Icarus, does a fall become likely. Otherwise, the degree of ability is more or less sufficient for the descent as well. The aviation industry, which is certainly a non-Icarian art form, proves this every day, as does disciplined alpinism. It is only upon advancing into the unmastered and unsecured that the problem of a fall arises, whether the protagonist undertakes something at their own risk, of which they lack the technique, or attempt something new that they cannot have mastered by virtue of its untried nature. I shall refrain from elaborating on these reflections with reference to the situations of the artist, the criminal, the dictator, and the merchant adventurer. They are all in situations that are unimaginable without an inherent inclination to fail, though not without a chance to learn something in the respective situation. With these in mind, one can recall the saying attributed to Oliver Cromwell that a man never climbs higher than when he does not know where he is going. At the base camp the last humans. Following on from Binswanger's expositions on anthropological proportionality, we arrive at what I shall call the base camp problem. Once again, Nietzsche must inevitably be considered its inventor. It appears at the moment when Zarathustra, the prophet of humanity's ascent beyond itself, in a way that can no longer be conceived of platonically, stumbles at the very start of his mission on the fact that the vast majority of people have no interest in becoming more than they are. If one investigates the average direction of their wishes, one finds that they simply want a more comfortable version of what they have. This state of the culture of wishes is where Zarathustra's words about the last human initiate uh, 
This state of the culture of wishes is where Zarathustra's words about the last human initiate his attack on the audience. His improvised second speech, the first had announced the Ubermensch, is meant to describe the most despicable creature under the sun, the human without longing, the final stuffy bourgeois who has invented happiness and gazes after the passing woman while sunbathing by the pool. Why else would he be squinting? In his address, however, which one could incidentally call the first virtual pop event in the history of philosophy, Zarathustra miscalculates. Attempting to speak to the pride of his listeners, he reaches the conclusion that they have none, and are not interested in regaining it. Hence the enthusiastic response from the audience, which, after Zarathustra's failed provocation, therapeutic intervention, is, Give us this last human! Zarathustra has no reply to this. From that point on, he divides people into his audience and his friends. The audience consists of those able to ask themselves, what is in it for me if I exceed myself? Nietzsche's talk of the last human provides the first version of the base camp problem. It appears as soon as it becomes possible to claim programmatically that base camps and summits are the same thing. Or, more precisely, when some can argue in all seriousness that the stay at the base camp and its prolongation render any form of summit expedition superfluous. Now I've already explained indirectly how such understandings of existence on the plateau of Mount Improbable become plausible from the 19th century on, both in Darwinism and in Marxism. They follow from the standard interpretation of evolutionary theory, where the human being in the status quo embodies the final stage of becoming, with the only unsolved matter being the redistribution of end-stage achievements. This is what is argued in the corresponding social-political programs. The entire 20th century is marked by equations of base camp and summit, founded on different ideological justifications. From the early proclamations of design for a transformation of everyday life, to the total coexistence of life forms in postmodernism. In a related spirit, analytic philosophy declared ordinary language the last language, and liberalism turned the amalgam of consumption and insurance the last horizon. And liberalism termed the amalgam of consumption and insurance the last horizon. It may be that ecologism, which is in the process of becoming the central discourse of the present day, constitutes the extrapolation of this tendency into the 21st century through the fact that it has proclaimed ecosystems and species the last natures, thus asserting the inviolability of their present state of development. One could therefore say that the philosophy of the 20th century, especially in its social philosophical varieties, offers, for the reasons already hinted at, nothing more than a series of statements about the base camp problem. The authors I have quoted also cast their votes on the matter, usually in a both-and form, with an emphasis on the basal side. Of these... Nietzsche is the only one who unconditionally embraced the primacy of the vertical. For him, the only justification for the base camp is as a starting point for expeditions to ever higher and more obscure summits. Closest to him are early and late Foucault, and the heroistically inclined early Heidegger, who had not yet understood that the national revolution with which he wanted to set out into the German destiny was nothing more than a base camp gone wild. In Wittgenstein's Tractacus period, too, there the author used his well-known disposable ladder. There are traces of the hope that one could climb over the horizontal universe of facts and proceed to the ethical summit through a vertical act. In later Wittgenstein, on the other hand, as well as middle period Foucault and late Heidegger, there is an unmistakable shift to the horizontal. They perform, each in their own way and for very different reasons, a sort of resignatio ad mediocritatum. Mediocritatum. The playing of language games. 
the repeated study of the discourses of earlier power games, and the late pietistic waiting for a new sign of being. These are all attitudes in a camp where the path evidently comes to an end, even if the authors have preserved some leftover aspirations to ascent. As far as Binschwanger is concerned, it seems to me that he does not develop an opinion on his own on the critical question, instead contenting himself with a reference to the desirability of quote-unquote anthropological proportionality. As he sympathised with the late Heidegger on the one hand, but on the other hand as a member of the psychiatric mountain rescue corps, attempting to retrieve the extravagant, one can consider him one of the outposts of the base camp, who, because of their profession, still had some understanding of the dynamics of verticality. Bourdieu, thinker of the last camp. Among the authors in the second half of the 20th century, Pierre Bourdieu stands out for the problematic merit that in his work, the rejection of any notion of summit expeditions took on dogmatic proportions. He is, to put it pointedly, the sociologist of the definitive base camp, and even acted for a while as its intellectual prefect, comparable in this respect to Jürgen Habermas, whose publications on the theory of communicative action can likewise be read as pamphlets on the overall completion of base camps and flat areas. Bourdieu's appearance on the French intellectual scene had taken place in the early 1960s, when the theoretical field, to take up one of its preferred concepts, was almost completely occupied by Marxistically coded forms of social critique. As a temporary assistant to Raymond Aron, and a reader of Max Weber, Emile Durkheim and Alfred Schutz, he could not fail to see the inadequacies of Marxist approaches especially in their fatal extrapolations in, by Lenin and Stalin. If he wished to earn a place in the success field of French critical culture, he would have to leave aside the implausible language games of impoverishment and exploitation critique, compensating for their lost offensive power through additional efforts in the area of power critique. This could only be achieved by progressing from a theory of direct domination to a logic of domination without dominators. Now it was anonymous and pre-personal agencies that gained the rank of a repressive sovereign. This constellation spawned all the turns and innovations that characterise Bourdieu's variety of critical theory. And, as German readers know, critical theory is a pseudonym for a Marxism abandoned by a faith in the possibility of revolution. In this situation, the theory itself, along with an art that behaves increasingly subversively, becomes a substitute for revolution. The foremost characteristic of Marxist thought was the introduction of an anti-idealistic hierarchy of reality. According to this, the base, understood as a political-economical praxis, possesses a higher reality content, more power to bring about effects and side effects than all other spheres, which accordingly had to content themselves with the role of a superstructure determined by the base. As this demotion to secondary status concerned the state, the legal system, the educational system and all other articulations of culture, the political ontology of the basal mode made a deep caesura in the traditional ecology of the spirit. The most consistent realisation of this approach could be observed in Stalinism, whose modus operandi can be summed up in a simple formula. Destruction of the superstructure by connecting it to the base. Habitus, the class within me. Whoever wanted to found a critical theory after 1945 could, in the light of Stalin's actions, only do so via an alternative understanding of reality as praxis. It was therefore necessary to redefine praxis and to show that it followed different laws from those described in economically bound standard Marxism. 
This only became feasible by moving the base lower down, and anyone who wanted to go deeper here had to climb down from the level of production processes to that of psychopolitical realities. The zeitgeist did its bit to support his this intention. From a theory historical perspective, the rise of the body began in the 1960s, when late Marxism realised how much its survival depended on proving that there was a substitute base. In Germany, the, the turn took place mostly in the form of studies on the deformed subjective factor, while in France a form of ethnological field research on the incorporation of class mentalities established itself. In truth, Bourdieu had become aware of the profound difference between an economy of honour and one of exchange since his investigations, begun in 1958, into the North Algerian agricultural societies of Kabylia. Kabylia? This led him to seek a new answer to the base question. This is where Bourdieu's most important conceptual innovation, the idea of habitus, comes into play. It undoubtedly constitutes one of the most fruitful tools of contemporary sociology, even though, as I will show, Bourdieu himself only uses it in a very restricted way. The greatest merit of the habit concept is that, with its help, an a prima vista satisfying answer is provided to the two insoluble riddles of conventional Marxism. Firstly, how the so-called base can mirror itself in the so-called superstructure, and secondly, how society infiltrates individuals and keeps itself present within them. The solution is this. Through class-specific psychosomatic forms of training, the social lodges itself in the individuals as a disposition at once produced and producing unfolding an autonomous life that, while open to experience and life historically active, is ultimately shaped indelibly by the past. The analogy between habitus and language immediately catches the eye, for it too forms a structured and structuring social reality sedimented in the speakers. The structuralist zeitgeist of the 1960s may have ensured that Bourdieu temporarily engaged with the work of Ferdinand de Saussure, in which the matter at hand was thematized under the term langue. De facto, Bourdieu invoked an analogy between his concept of habitus and Chomsky's idea of grammar, insofar as one understands the latter as a system of conditioned spontaneities based on physically rooted deep structures. The possibility of comparison comes on the one hand from class-dependent behavioural dispositions, and on the other hand from grammar-dependent conditionings of speech. One could say that the habitus is the first language of the class training performed on me, and however much individuals might strive for the new content and competencies in the course of their lives, they remain shaped by their mother tongue in Bourdieu's eyes. And, because they are shaped, they in turn shape. Base and physis, or where is society? The habitus, then, is the somatized class consciousness. It clings to us like a dialect that never disappears, one that not even Henry Higgins would be able to drive out of Miss Doolittle. When Trimalchio, the freed slave who subsequently acquired wealth, tastelessly displays his wealth at his banquets, the members of the old elite recognize the typical slave in him. When Bourdieu, on the other hand, the grandson of a poor maitayer and the son of a postman from Bayan, rose to become a master thinker and dominate the field of academic sociology in France, the thought of the ineradicable habitus of his class helped them to allay the suspicion that he had betrayed his origins through his career. From this perspective, the theory of habitus has the inestimable advantage of serving the moral reassurance of its author, 
even if I wanted to betray my own class, it would be impossible because its absorption into my old Adam forms the basis of my social being. Well, aside from that, the theory helps its users in the academic world and the open intellectual market alike to maintain the pretense of critique by providing them with a means of reducing the manifold vertical differentiations of society to the simple matrix of the privileges of power, be they the prerogatives of the male sex or of capital owners, material or symbolic. The price board you had to pay for lowering the base dimension into the psychophysical structures of the individual was much higher than he himself realised. Firstly, as already hinted, this habitus concept made him forfeit the better means for describing the play of vertical tensions in the numerous disciplinic fields of the social space with sufficient accuracy. De facto, Bourdieu's work as a writer is original and fruitful. For example, in his analysis of the struggles for distinction in the ethnography of Homo academicus, not primarily through the application of the habitus concept, but rather through the author's intense attention as an outsider to rivalry-based ranking systems where class influences play a certain part, but are not decisive. At his best, Bourdieu writes a satire without laughs about the nouveau riche and the ambitious, where he thinks most profoundly he touches on the tragic leftovers of the human condition. A further weakness of the habitus concept interpreted thus is that it cannot grasp the individualized forms of existential self-designs. Bourdieu's analysis necessarily remains within the typical, the pre-personal and the average, as if homo sociologicus were to have the last word on all matters. In a certain sense, Bourdieu parodies the analysis of the they in Heidegger's Being in Time from an inverted perspective, while human Dasein is, for Heidegger, quote, proximally and for the most part, zunächst und zumeist, subject to the anonymity of the they, and only attains authenticity through an act of decisiveness. I forgot to close the quotes, I'll read that again. While human design is for Heidegger, quote, proximally and for the most part, end quote, so next und is zu meist, subject to the anonymity of the they, and only attains authenticity through an act of decisiveness. The authenticity of existence for Bourdieu lies in the habitus, over which a more or less random superstructure of ambitions, competencies and attributes of distinction accumulates. This reversal of the they analysis follows almost automatically from agreement with the political ontology of practical thought, which states that the base is more real than the things that are superstructurally added. This would mean that humans are most themselves where their shaping through the habitus preempts them, as if the most genuine part of us were our absorbed class. The part of us that is not ourselves is most ourselves. The habitus theory provides a clandestine hybrid of Heidegger and Lukács, by taking from the former the idea of a self dispersed among the they, and from the latter the concept of class consciousness. It builds the two figures together in such a way that the pre-conscious class in itself, within us, becomes our true self. This corresponds to Bourdieu's division of the social space into diverse fields, in which one naturally finds no persons, only habitus-controlled agents who are compelled to realise their programmes within the spaces offered by the field. Whoever considers such suggestions acceptable may ultimately also find it plausible that in Distinction, Bourdieu's most successful book, the passing of aesthetic or culinary judgments of taste constitutes a reproductive medium of domination. Word should have got around among sociologists that one can arrive at substantially more precise statements in these matters with a more horizontally than vertically differentiating theory of milieu combined with an instrument for observing mimetic mechanisms. Readers note mimetic here, 
mimetic as in shaping and being shaped by, not mimetic as in, you know, JPEGs. Um, combined with an instrument for observing mimetic mechanisms than with a theory of anonymous domination. As far as the base superstructure schema as such is concerned, it has been refuted too often to mirror any further comments. I would add that little effort would be required in order to show that the augmenting element often has no less power over reality than that which it augments, and sometimes even more. If this were not the case, humans would only seemingly be alterable and learning beings. On the genius of habit, Aristotle and Thomas. The decisive weakness of the habitus concept in Bourdieu's version, however, is that it does not depict what it purports to be explaining namely the region of habit, in a remotely adequate fashion. In this author's work, the great tradition of philosophical and psychophysiological reflection on the role of habits in the formation of human existence shrinks to a remainder that is usable for the purpose of a critique of power. Instead of entering the panorama of effective subject-forming acts through practice, training and accustoming, habitus theory a la Bourdieu, contents itself with that narrow segment of habits that constitute the sediments of the class within us. It cheats its users of the wealth of that to which its name refers. Naturally, Bourdieu, who adopted the term from Irvin Panofsky's study Gothic Architecture and Scholasticism in 1951, was generally aware of its philosophical history. He knew that the habitus concept in Thomas Aquinas and the Hexus concept in Aristotle had to play a substantial part in underpinning the establishment of an ethics within the framework of an eratological anthropology, anthropology. That is, a theory which portrays human beings as the creatures capable of virtues. But consciously ignored the broad understanding of the Habitus doctrine, restricting himself to those aspects which were suitable for his purposes. Among the earlier authors, one already finds the well-developed figure of habitus as an elastic mechanism of a two-sided, passive, spontaneous quality. The force of habit was understood by the ancients not simply as being overwhelmed by routines, but as a pre-personally based generative principle of action. When the scholastics speak of habitus, they do not mean a Janos-headed disposition looking back with one face at a series of similar past acts in which it manifested itself, while the other face looks ahead to a new occasion on which it will prove itself anew. The habitus thus constitutes a potency that is formed by earlier acts and updates itself in a new one. Such a concept naturally came in handy for Bourdieu, as a sociologist, he was on the lookout for concepts that place human behaviour in a plausible intermediate position between excessive social determination and unlimited individual spontaneity. However, he only took over those elements of the classical habitus concept that could be integrated into his version of the base, which, as stated above, means the pre-conscious effects of the quote-unquote class within us. Both Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, by contrast, had been concerned with explaining the possibility of the virtuous within us, or even the good within us. They understood habit, insofar as it is good habit, as an embodied disposition that prepares the actor for virtuous actions, and indeed in the case of bad habits, for bad deeds, though these are not the focus of their investigation. For the classical thinkers of practical philosophy, hexus and habitus are constantly on call. They are expected to leap up when the occasion arises and carry out the good and valuable as if it were the easiest thing in the world. It can only appear easy, however, if and because sustained practice has eroded the improbability of good in advance. As explanations for the challenging circumstance that humans insofar as they act morally and aesthetically, are always determined by a state of having and being had, influencing and being influenced, disposing and 
being disposed, acting and having acted. Hexus and habitus are anything but the mere auxiliary concepts of a critical sociology. They are anthropological concepts that describe a seemingly mechanical process in terms of insistence and intensification in order to elucidate the incarnation of the mental. They identify man as the animal capable of doing what, is, what it is supposed to, if one has tended to its ability early enough. At the same time, they see the dispositions already attained growing further into new, heightened forms. Thomas does not need to write any letters about the aesthetic education of the human race to achieve that. Conceptual clarifications with instructions on how to be ready for good are entirely sufficient. It is, in fact, already possible to read the classical theory of habitus as a theory of training. Whoever has practiced properly overcomes the improbability of good and allows virtue to seem like second nature. Second natures are dispositions of ability that enable humans to stay on their level as artists of virtus. They perform the near impossible, the best, as if it were something easy, spontaneous and natural that virtually happens of its own accord. Good, to be sure, is not yet understood as an obligation, much less a value dependent on my positing and evaluating it. It is the rope stretched out by God on which the artists of overcoming must walk. And overcoming always means passing off the wondrous as the effortless. That is why Jean Genet, in his crypto-Catholically inspired advice for the tightrope walker, recommended always keeping in mind that he owed everything to the rope. Even if we can no longer think about good in the same way, the classical analysis of habitus remains current. It can easily be translated, mutatus mutandus, into the languages of contemporary training psychology, neuro-cybernetics, and pragmatics. With its help, the psychophysical conditions of possibility of correct, approximate, and skilled actions can be explained as a high standard with proximity to their subject. It certainly does not, as the crypto-Marxist interpretation of the base would like, explain how the social enters the body. It rather states how the disposition for carrying out what is good, correct and appropriate can be incorporated into human existence. Allow me to add, good, correct and appropriate are names for the extraordinary, to whose nature it belongs to appear in the guise of the normal. The older theory of habitus thus forms part of a doctrine of incorporation and information of virtues. It is applied aritology, carried out in the form of a deep analysis of the force working within active people. Excuse me. Working within active people. The force that strives towards the act. An informed energy of this kind carries its self-reinforcing principle within itself. Its optimization is not subject to any limits imposed from without. Even the saints, writes Prosper of Aquitaine, quote, always have something left in which they must be able to grow, end quote. Super est quo crescere possent. Whoever takes up the habitus theory as formulated by Thomas is already halfway to an interpretation of being human as an artistry of good. This provides an anthropological concept for the effectiveness of inner technologies that subtly articulates the vertical tension inherent in every area of ability. It explains how precisely that which is already carried out fairly successfully feels the pull of something better, and why that which is performed with great skill stands in the attraction field of an even higher skill. The authentic form of the habitus theory describes humans in all discretion as acrobats of virtus. One could also say as carriers of a moral competency that turns into social and artistic power. That is the wide open door through which the thinkers of the Renaissance only had to pass to transform the saints 
into the virtuosos. Homo Bordivinos, the other last human. By this standard of analysis, Bourdieu's appropriation of the habitus concept seems like a willful impoverishment. It resembles a regression to an involuntary pre-Socratism, in which the division of possessions into tameable passions and formable habits has not yet taken place. Homo Bordivinus is like one possessed by class, riding both having and had in a circle on the broomstick of habitus. He is the human at the base camp who acts as if it were the goal of the expedition. For him, the journey upwards is over before it has begun. This youngest brother of the last human has been drastically shown that whatever distinctions he might acquire are never more than supplements to the habitus, pseudo-vertical differentiations within the camp population. What Bourdieu calls the class society is a base camp where all ascents are, uh, take place internally, while ascents to external goals are strictly ruled out. As Bourdieu, like any member of a non-utopian left, secretly knows all too well that the quote-unquote classless society cannot exist for any number of convincing reasons, critique at the base camp is limited to keeping up the appearance of critique which makes sense as long as gains and distinction in the critical scene can thus be achieved. Hence Bourdieu's success in the milieu populated by the quote-unquote conformists of being different. We have found the base, say the camp dwellers, and blink. It should hardly be necessary to emphasise here that these objections should not be mistaken for destructive criticism. Bourdieu's direct and indirect contributions to understanding human practice behaviour are in some respects as valuable as Wittgenstein's language game theory and Foucault's discourse analyses. But, like those projects, the habitus theory in the form propounded by Bourdieu needs to be turned around to release its stimulating potential for a general theory of anthropotechnics. For this, it is enough to disentangle the habitus concept, to separate it from the fixation on class phenomena, and restore the wealth of meaning it possessed in the Aristotelian, and later the empiricist tradition. It only unfolds its full power, however, when combined with Nietzsche's program of positivizing asceticisms. This would be the equivalent in today's context of the somewhat inappropriate term used by Nietzsche, that of making natural. This demands a dissolution of the singular habitus, one head, one habitus, and an uncovering of the multitude of discrete, habitual readiness to act that accumulate in each individual. This brings to light the unsummarizable plurality of elaborable habits or trainable ability modules of which real individuals consist. Bourdieu's habitus is the ensemble of social relations, well known since the sixth thesis on Feuerbach, which can no longer be thought of as an abstract being, but is rather inherent in the individual. Admittedly, even Marx had not conceived this inherence adequately, being even more of a slave to the stereotypes of power critique than Bourdieu. If class-specific aspects manifest themselves in the ensemble of disciplines and practice complexes that de facto constitute what is concretely inherent in the individual, then all the better for us if we have learned from Bourdieu how to decipher them. Privileging this layer of the assimilated as the base is more of a concern for sociologists. Teaching as a profession. The attack on the inertias. At this stage of our reflections, it can become clear why and with what intention the older tradition turned its attention to such topics as habit, hexus and habitus. The explication of behaviour, the habitual, the psychomatically assimilated is, as implied in the references to ethics as first theory, 
a partial phenomenon of the process. I termed the division of possession into passions and habits. This transformation took place under pressure from the first educators, who were naturally the most significant carriers of the ethical, ascetic attack on the existing psychosocial conditions. One can only grasp the true meaning of the 2,000-year molestation of humanity by teachers if one examines the angle from which the knowing attack, the not-yet-knowing. Only where the secularization of the psyche was on the daily agenda, for individuals and collectives alike, did the inner condition of inertia among those to be taught become thematic for the teachers. These, as some now began to understand, are responsible for the fact that people cannot simply follow the directions of their new ethical directors without further ado. If the first philosopher pedagogues spoke obsessively about habits, then it was in the context of a resistance analysis. Its purpose was to show how that its purpose was to show how that already present without humans, namely the hexus, yeah, I see. Let me try that again. Its purpose was to show how that already present within humans, namely the hexus, the habitus, the doxa, joined in the 18th century by prejudice, hinders or entirely prevents the absorption of the new, the philosophical ethos, the explicit logos, the purified mathesis, and the clarified method. Habit both the word and the matter, stands for the factual possession of the psyche by a block of already acquired and more or less irreversibly embodied properties, which also include the resilient mass of opinions dragged along. As long as the block rests inert, the new education cannot begin. The observations of this kind were also collected and documented in the Asian world, demonstrated by the well-known anecdote of the Zen master who, to the amazement of his pupil, poured a cup of tea, and did not stop when it was full, rather continuing to pour. This was meant to show that a full spirit cannot be taught anything. The course of study, then, consists in pondering the question of how to empty the cup, whether one should subsequently fill it anew or cultivate its emptiness, once reached, as a value of its own, is another matter. The early schools are, on the whole, base camps whose board members have impressive peak-scaling ambitions, even if the definitions of those peaks are school-specific. Each school spontaneously develops an internal verticality, and sooner or later are systems of levels that produces a class society sui generis. One can still recognise the origin of the term class from non-political gradations quite well here. But the early school, for the time being, retains a natural extroversion. It follows tasks that transcend its system, whether in the qualification of students for professions and offices, supracurricular perfection and personality forming, illumination, or the supremacy of philosophers, or whatever else the great shots in the dark might be called. The late school, by contrast, puts an end to transcendent pretensions, and fends off the notion that there could be anything real outside the school. It then turns into the base camp whose inhabitants only study for shifts of location within the camp, just as it was Bourdieu's primary intuition to describe the games of ambition in class society as pseudo-vertical efforts to acquire more or less illusory gains in distinction. Identity as the right to laziness. The world of pseudo-verticality is the playground of identities. An identity, after all, whether presented as personal or collective, can only become attractive and valuable if people wish to distinguish themselves from one another without the license to set themselves apart hierarchically. In this view, the concept of identity circulating in contemporary sociology forms the generalised counterpart to Bourdieu's doctrine of habitus. With its help, inertia is elevated from a deficiency requiring correction to a phenomenon of value. My identity consists of the complex of my unrevisable personal and cultural inertias. 
while Sartre claimed, the totality of my possessions reflects the totality of my being, I am what I have. The identity owners say, I am what has me. The reality of my being is guaranteed by the sum of those things that possess me. The identicals take themselves as a ready-made. In the documents folder, they step with themselves under the wide roof of values that have a claim to preservation. They introduce themselves as systems of inertia, demanding the latter's idealization by ascribing the highest cultural value to the inert dis deposited within themselves. While the Stoics of antiquity devoted their lives to the goal of erecting within themselves through constant practice the statue that crafted its best self from invisible marble, the moderns find themselves as finished inertia sculptures and set themselves up in the park of identities, regardless of whether they prefer the ethnic wing or the individualistic open-air space. Next to habitus, therefore, identity is the central value of base camp culture. And if identity is augmented by a trauma, there is nothing left to obstruct the idealization of the value core. What is decisive is that the very thought of new heights must be frowned upon. If they were climbed, the deposited stores could lose worth. If, and because previous achievements as such are placed under cultural protection, any expedition project in the vertical is sacrilege, a mockery of all framed values. In the regime of identities, all energies are de-verticalized and handed over to the filing department. From there, they are passed on to the permanent collection, where there is neither progressive hanging nor evolutionary gradation. In the horizon of the base camp, each identity is worth every other. Identity thus provides the super habitus for all those who want to be as their local influences have made them and are content with that. In this way, the identicals ensure that they are out of earshot of the imperative, you must change your life, should it unexpectedly sound again somewhere. <laughs>